Thank you for listening to Rex vs. Wems, The Boston Massacre Trial. This theatrical presentation is produced by Revolution 250, directed by Evan O'Brien, and recorded and edited by Chart Productions. This presentation is a revised performance of Rex vs. Wems, The Boston Massacre Trial, first performed in 1999, written by Professor Joseph McKettrick, and produced by Suffolk University Law School and the Bostonian Society. This recording has been made with permission from Suffolk University Law School. This presentation features the vocal talents of Angelo Alexander as witness Dr. John Jeffries, Michael Barry as witness Henry Knox, Kevin Casey as Justice John Cushing, Stephen Chuka as witness Benjamin Burdick, Henry Cook as witness Dr. Richard Hirons, Christopher Sherwood Davis as defense counsel Josiah Quincy Jr., Josiah George as defense counsel John Adams, Scott Harris as witness David Mitchelson, Jim Hollister as witness James Bailey, Judith Calaora as witness Jane Whitehouse, Timothy Lawton as clerk Samuel Winthrop, Jonathan Lane as Justice Peter Oliver, Ethan Mantelos as Chief Justice Benjamin Lind, Graham Marsden as witness Edward Langford, Roland Million Jr. as witness Andrew, Jeff Mitchell as counsel for the prosecution Samuel Quincy, Connor Maroney as counsel for the prosecution Robert Treat Payne, Evan O'Brien as jury foreman Joseph Mayo, Paul O'Shaughnessy as Justice Edmund Trowbridge, Doug Ozalius as witness Richard Palms, Michael Quigg as witness Samuel Hemingway, and Alan White as witness Newton Prince. Revolution 250 would like to thank the following people and organizations that contributed to or supported this program. Jordan Rich and Ken Carberry at Chart Productions. Suffolk University Law School. Professor Bob Allison. Professor Joseph McKettrick. Jonathan Lane, Revolution 250. J. L. Bell. George Camo and the Boston Business Improvement District. History at Play, Carol Copeland Thomas, and the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. This adaptation is derived from notes taken by John Hodson, who was present in court during the eight-day trial in 1770. Some testimony may have been edited or modified. Please be advised that the language included in this program is presented as originally provided in witness testimony in 1770 and include some language that communicates racial prejudices of the time. And now, a message from Revolution 250 President, Professor Bob Allison. Welcome to Rex vs. Wemps. I am Bob Allison from Revolution 250, a collaborative effort among groups to commemorate the American Revolution, and we're delighted to bring you this presentation. March 5th, 1770. Soldiers from the 29th Regiment, stationed in Boston, fired into a crowd of angry Bostonians. When the smoke cleared, four Bostonians were dead. One would die in the next week. Six others were critically wounded. Over the night, Thomas Hutchinson, the lieutenant governor, took depositions as to what had happened. And early the next morning, he ordered Captain Thomas Preston, Corporal William Wems, and seven soldiers arrested, charged with murder. They had fired unprovoked into an unarmed crowd. This trial would become a pivotal moment for Massachusetts, for the emerging country, and the world. Most Bostonians wanted the soldiers who were not charged removed from town, and those who were to be hanged for murder. But in a surprise move, two of Boston's leading patriots, Josiah Quincy and John Adams, stepped forward to defend the most hated men in Massachusetts, arguing that they should get a fair trial. And this is what happened in the fall of 1770, as John Adams and Josiah Quincy defend these soldiers, not only against the charges from the Crown, but against the angry populace. And that's the story we will now hear. the prisoners! No! Upsters, you'll get yours today! Playbacks! You spilled innocent Boston blood on the snow on King Street! Murderers! Now you all hang for it! There'll be 
see none of that. All rise. Hear ye! Hear ye! Hear ye! All persons having anything to do before the Honourable, the Justices of His Majesty's Superior Court of Judicature and Court of Assize, now sitting at Boston, within and for the County of Suffolk, Province of Massachusetts Bay, draw near, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. Chief Justice Benjamin Lynn Jr. presiding, with Justices Edmund Trowbridge, John Cushing, and Peter Oliver. God save His Majesty the King, George III. Court is open, you may be seated. Defendants, please rise. How say you, William Wems, James Hartigan, William McCauley, Hugh White, Matthew Kilroy, William Warren, John Carroll, Hugh Montgomery, are you guilty of the felony and murder whereof you stand indicted or not guilty? Not, not guilty. guilty. How will you be tried? By, By God, God and our, our country. country. God send you a good deliverance. You, the prisoners at the bar, these good men, which were last called and do now appear, are those who are to pass between our sovereign lord the king and you upon the trial of your several lives. If therefore you will challenge them, or any of them, you must challenge them as they are called to be sworn, before they are sworn, and you shall be heard. The gentlemen of the jury, Joseph Mayo of Roxbury, to serve as foreman. Samuel Davenport of Milton, Nathaniel Davis of Roxbury, Joseph Houghton of Milton, Abraham Wheeler of Dorchester, Consider Atherton of Stoughton, Edward Pierce of Dorchester, Jacob Cushing Jr. of Stoughton, Isaiah Thayer of Braintree, Josiah Lane of Hingham, Benjamin Fisher of Dedham, Jonathan Burr of Hingham. Jurors, raise your hands. You shall well and truly try and deliverance make between our sovereign lord the king and the prisoners at the bar, whom you shall have in charge according to the evidence, so help you God. Prisoners, hold up your hands. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoners and hearken to the charge. Upon each and every of these several indictments, the prisoners at the bar have been arraigned and upon their arraignment have pleaded not guilty, and for trial put themselves upon God and their country, which country you are. Your charge, therefore, is to inquire whether they or either of them be guilty of the felony and murder whereof they stand indicted or not guilty. If either of them are guilty, you are to say so. If they or either of them are not guilty, you are to say so and no more. Good men and true, stand together and hearken to your evidence. Mr. Samuel Quincy, the crown may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. The prisoners at the bar are that party of soldiers belonging to His Majesty's 29th Regiment, when the evening of the 5th of March last deliberately fired on the inhabitants of this town in King Street. They are charged in five indictments with the willful premeditated murder of five different persons. They have pled not guilty and by that plea have thrown upon the crown the burden of proving the facts alleged. It is my province, therefore, to give you evidence in support of this charge, and yours, gentlemen of the jury, to determine whether they are guilty or not. The cause is solemn and important, no less than whether eight of your fellow subjects shall live or die. 
a cause grounded on the most melancholy event that has yet taken place on the continent of America, and of the greatest expectation of any that has yet come before a tribunal of civil justice. I am aware how difficult it is, and more especially in this trial, to preserve the mind perfectly indifferent. But you are bound not only by natural obligations towards God and man, but also by an oath to examine into the evidence without partiality or prejudice. In support of these accusations against the prisoners at the bar, it is incumbent on the Crown to ascertain the following. The identity of the persons charged, the fact of killing, and the circumstances attending and aggravating that killing. The Crown will now present that evidence. The Crown calls Edward G. Langford. All witnesses, please stand. Do all you witness solemnly swear that the testimony you shall give before the court and the jury shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I, I do. do. I am Edward G. Langford, a town watchman. Were you in King Street that evening, the 5th of March? Yes. What happened that evening? The bells began to ring and people cried, Fire! I ran with the rest into King Street. I asked where the fire was. I was told there was no fire, but that the soldiers at Murray's barracks had been fighting with the inhabitants. As I got to the town pump, I saw 20 or 25 boys going into King Street. I went into King Street myself and saw several boys about the sentry box at the custom house. They said the sentry had knocked down a boy. They crowded in over the gutter. I told them to let the sentry alone. He went up the steps of the custom house and knocked at the door, but could not get in. I told him not to be afraid. They were only boys and would not hurt him. Do you know the sentry? Yes, uh, that's he. Do you know any of the rest? Yes, that man. Were they pressing on him? They were as far as the gutter. He went up the steps and called out. What he said, I do not remember. To whom did he call? I do not know. He went up the steps and leveled his piece with the bayonet fixed. As I was talking with the sentry and telling him not to be afraid, the soldiers came down. I drew back from the sentry towards the Royal Exchange Lane. I did not see them load, but somebody said, Are you loaded? Samuel Gray struck me on the shoulder and said, Langford, what's here to pay? What said you to Samuel Gray? I said, I did not know what was to pay, but I believed something would come of it very soon. He made no reply. Immediately a gun went off. I was within reach of their guns and bayonets. One of them thrust at me with his bayonet and ran it through my jacket and greatcoat. Did you hear the word given to load? I heard the questions asked whether they were loaded. I heard no orders to load. Somebody then said, are you all ready? I distinctly heard the word given to fire, twice. How many people were there before the soldiers at that time? About 40 or 50, but there were many in the lane. Had any of the inhabitants sticks or clubs? I do not know. I had one myself because I belonged to the watch. How many soldiers were there? I did not count them. Uh, about seven or eight, I think. Who fired the first gun? I do not know. Where was the man that fired standing? He stood on my right as I stood facing them. I stood about halfway between the box and Royal Exchange Lane. I looked this man Kilroy in the face and I bid him not to fire. But he immediately fired and Samuel Gray fell at my feet. 
Kilroy thrust his bayonet immediately through my coat and jacket. I ran towards the watch house and stood there. Where did Kilroy stand? He stood on the right of the party. You say you spoke to him before he fired. What did you say to him? I said, damn you, or god damn you, do not fire, and immediately he fired. How many guns went off before he fired? Two, but I saw nobody fall. Samuel Gray fell close to me. I, I was leaning on my stick. Did Gray say anything to Kilroy before he fired? He spoke to nobody but me. Did Gray throw any snowballs? No, nor did he have a weapon in his hand. Did you see anything thrown? No, I saw nothing at all thrown. Were you so near Gray that if he had thrown anything, you must have seen it? Yes, and his hands were across his chest. Immediately after Kilroy fired, Gray fell. Did you hear any other gun at that time? None, till I got near to the watch house. How near were the people standing to the soldiers at the time that gun shot Gray? They were standing near the gutter. Did you see anything hit the soldiers? No, I saw nothing thrown. I heard the rattling of their guns and took it to be one run against another. This rattling was at the time Kilroy fired, and at my right I had a fair view of them. I saw nobody strike nor offer a blow. Have you any doubt in your mind that it was Kilroy's gun that killed Samuel Gray? No matter of doubt. It must have been for no other gun discharged at that time. Josiah Quincy, you may cross-examine. Did you see anybody press on the soldiers with a large cordwood stick? No. After Gray fell, did Kilroy thrust at him with his bayonet? No, it was at me he pushed. Did Gray say anything to Kilroy or Kilroy to him? No, not to my knowledge, and I stood close to him. Did you perceive Kilroy take aim at Gray? I did not. He was as liable to kill me as him. The Crown calls James Bailey. I am James Bailey, a sailor. Did you see any of the prisoners in King Street on the 5th of March last? Yes, Carroll and Montgomery, and White, who is the sentry there. Were you there before the party came down? Yes. In what part of the street? I was standing along with White, the sentry, on the Custom House steps. I saw some boys round the sentry, none older than 17 or 18 years. What number? 20 or 30. Did anything pass between you and the sentry? Yes. When I first went up to White, I said, what is the matter? He said he did not know. The boys were throwing pieces of ice at him. After I went to him, they threw no more. I stood with him five or six minutes. Did you see the pieces of ice thrown? Yes. What sort of pieces? Were they big enough to hurt a man? Yes. Hard and large enough to hurt any man. As big as one's fist. Did White complain about it? He said very little to me, only that he was afraid if the boys did not disperse, there would be something very soon. He did not mention what. Did he tell them to disperse? No, he did not say a word to them. Did you see any of the pieces of ice hit White? Nothing was thrown after I went to him. If anything was thrown, it was before. How came you to go to him? I went up to him because I knew him and to see what was the matter. Did you hear him knock at the door? No. Did White call for any assistance? I did not hear him. Were you there at the time of firing? Yes. When the soldiers reinforcing White came down, Carroll came up to me and clapped his bayonet to my breast. White said, do not hurt him. Was that before the reinforcing soldiers had formed? Yes, immediately on their first coming down. I stood between the corner of the custom house and the post there, my arm atop the post. 
Did you hear the first gun fired? Yes. From what quarter? From the right. Do you know the man that fired that gun? It was Montgomery. He was next to me. When White told him not to hurt me, he took his hand and pushed me right behind him. Did that first shot kill or wound any person? I do not know. What space of time was it between the first and second gun? Half a minute or less. Did you see any ice or snow thrown between the first and second gun? No. Did you hear anything said? There was a noise among the inhabitants, but I cannot say what they said. Did you see anything thrown before the firing? Yes. Montgomery was knocked down with a stick, and his gun flew out of his hand. When he recovered himself, he discharged his gun. Do you know where he stood at that time? He was the very corner man on the right, close to me. Who stood next to him? I do not know. The man that stood the third from the right was Carroll. I believe he was the next that fired. Did you observe anybody strike Montgomery? Was a club thrown? The stroke came from a stick or club that was in somebody's hand, and the blow struck his gun and arm. Was Montgomery knocked down, or did the gun only fly out of his hand? He fell, I am sure. From the blow on his arm? Montgomery's gun flew out of his hand, and as he stooped to take it up, he fell. The blow struck his arm and maybe his body. Did you see the person that struck Montgomery? Was he a tall man? He was a stout man. Were people standing near the man that struck Montgomery's gun? Yes, a whole crowd, 50 or 60. When Montgomery took up his gun and fired, which way did he present? Toward Stone's Tavern. When Montgomery fired, I stooped down, and when the smoke was gone, I saw three lying dead. Was the blow Montgomery received upon the oath you have taken violent? Yes, very violent. When you came to the custom house and saw the boys throwing ice, where did the boys stand? In the middle of King Street. Were the pieces of ice thrown as hard as the boys could throw them? I believe the boys threw the ice as hard as they could. Before the firing, after the reinforcing party came down, did you see any snowballs, sticks, or ice thrown at them? No. Did you hear anything said to the reinforcing party? I heard nothing in particular said to them. I heard the cry of fire. Did you hear any threats? No. None at all. The defense may cross-examine. Do you remember your examination before the justices? Yes. Do you remember saying they were throwing sticks and cakes of ice? No, not at the reinforcing soldiers. Did you hear any cheers? Yes, I heard two or three cheers. What time? About two minutes before they fired. Did you hear anyone say, knock them over, kill them, kill them? No, I did not. What did the people seem to be doing? They stood in front of the soldiers, shouting. I saw no violence done, but to that one man. What did the people do immediately on the firing of the first gun? I could not see because of the smoke. Did Montgomery say anything upon the firing of his gun? Not a word, nor any of the soldiers. Did you see a group of persons coming up Royal Exchange Lane with sticks? No, I saw a group going up Corn Hill. Was this before the reinforcing guard came down or after? It was before the guard came down. How many might there be of that group? Between 20 and 30. They appeared to be sailors. Some had sticks. One fellow had a large cordwood stick. How long before the firing was it that you saw the group in Cornhill? Six, seven, or eight minutes, I believe. Were the bells ringing then? Yes. What did the group do or say? They were huzzaying, whistling, and carrying their sticks upright over their heads. What number of sticks do you suppose might be in the hole? Seven or eight, some of them whistling, some huzzaying and making noise. 
Did you know their intention? I did not. When they went up Corn Hill, I went up Royal Exchange Lane. Did you see any soldiers about that time in the street? Yes, I saw a number at Murray's Barracks and some officers driving them in. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. The Crown calls Richard Palms. I am Richard Palms, a merchant. Do you know any of the prisoners? I know Montgomery. I saw him on King Street with a party of soldiers on the evening of 5th March last. What happened that night? I went down. I saw Captain Preston at the head of seven or eight soldiers with their guns and bayonets fixed. I went to Captain Preston and saw Mr. Theodore Bliss talking with him, who said to Captain Preston, Why do you not fire? God damn you, fire! I asked Captain Preston if the soldiers were loaded. He said, Yes, with powder and ball. I said, I hope, sir, you're not going to fire upon the inhabitants. He said, by no means. That instant, I saw a piece of ice strike Montgomery's gun. Whether it sallied him back or he stepped one foot back, I do not know. But Montgomery recovered and fired immediately. I thought he stepped back and fired. He was the next man to Captain Preston, the only soldier that was between the captain and the custom house. When Montgomery fired, I heard the word, fire! Who said it? I do not know. Six or eight seconds after that, another soldier on the captain's right fired, and then the rest, one after the other, pretty quick. There was an interval of two or three seconds between the next to last gunshot and the last. How many guns were fired? I do not know for certain. Seven or eight, I believe. I did not count them. Before the last gun was fired, Montgomery made a push at me with his bayonet. I had a stick in my hand. I hit his left arm and I knocked his gun down. Before Montgomery recovered, I aimed another stroke at the nearest to me and hit Captain Preston. I then saw Montgomery pushing at me again. He would have pushed me through, but I threw my stick in his face. The third time, he ran after me to push at me again, but fell down. I then ran down Royal Exchange Lane. Mr. Quincy, you may cross-examine. Did you take notice of the situation of the soldiers? They were formed in a half circle. Which way did Montgomery front? He fronted the watch house. Are you certain that Montgomery was struck and sallied back before he fired? Oh, yes. Do you know whether he was struck with a piece of ice or a club? No. Do you know whether it was his body or his gun or both? Uh, struck both, I suppose. Did you see any other violence offered except that which struck Montgomery and the blows you aimed and gave? No, no other. Are you sure that Montgomery did not fall just before he discharged his gun? Yes. Upon the firing of the first gun, did the people seem to retire? Yes, they all began to run. When the rest were firing, they were running. Did you see any of the deceased fall? No, I did not. Afterward, I saw Samuel Gray, an addict's lying. Did you see all the rest of the soldiers discharge their pieces? I saw the smoke. It appeared to me at the time they all fired. When the last gun was fired, where were the people? They were running about everywhere. The Crown calls Samuel Hemingway. I am Samuel Hemingway, Sheriff Greenleaf's coachman. Do you know any of the prisoners? Yes, several. There is Kilroy I know particularly well. Did you ever hear Kilroy make any threats against the inhabitants of this town? Yes. One evening I heard him say he never would miss an opportunity when he had one to fire on the inhabitants, and that he wanted to have an opportunity ever since he landed. How long was that before the 5th of March? A week or fortnight. Who was present when this conversation passed? Mrs. Bouquer, Mr. Apthorpe's housekeeper. Was anyone else present? Only the Negro boy. What gave occasion for this? He and I were talking about the townspeople and the soldiers. Did he say it with any resentment? No, other than he would not miss an opportunity. Was Kilroy in anger or liquor? No. 
had any angry words passed between him and you at that time? No, none at all. Was it in jest? I do not know. I said he was a fool for talking so. He said he did not care. The crowd calls Benjamin Burdick. I am Benjamin Burdick, a barber and captain of the Watchmen who patrol around the townhouse. Did you see any of these prisoners in King Street the night of the 5th of March? Not that I can swear as they are dressed. I can recollect something of their faces, but cannot swear to them. When I came to King Street, I went immediately up to one of the soldiers. That man, who's bald, I asked him if any of the soldiers were loaded. He said yes. I asked him if they were going to fire. He said yes, by the eternal God, and pushed at me with his bayonet, which I put by with what was in my hand. What was in your hand? A Highland broadsword. What occasion had you to carry it? A young man that boarded with me was at the rope walks. He told me if several of the soldiers had a spite at him, and he believed he was in danger. The reason of carrying the sword was they spied the young man in the lane and dogged him, for he had been very active in the affray at the rope walks. The soldiers said they would sometime or other have satisfaction. I had looked upon myself liable to be insulted likewise. When alarmed by the cry of fire, my wife called after me. It is not a fire. It is an affray in King Street. If you are going, you had better take this. So I took it and ran down, and I asked the soldier what I just now told you. I knocked the bayonet with what was in my hand. Another pushed at me. I struck his gun. My face was toward the soldiers. I heard the first gun go off, and then the second gun went off. As I was looking to see if anybody was killed, I saw the tall man fall. Where were you when you hit the gun? Near the gutter, about the middle of the party. How long had the bells been ringing before you came from home? Thought it was nine of the clock, and did not think otherwise till somebody cried fire. Did you strike before the firing? Yes. Did you strike as hard as you could? Yes, and hit the lock of his gun, and if I had struck a little lower, I would have left a mark that I could swear to. Was the sword drawn in your hand? I drew it when the soldier pushed at me and struck at him, as I have mentioned. Which gun went off first? I took it to be the right-hand man. Did you see anything extraordinary to induce them to fire that gun? No. I suppose they knocked one gun against another and taking their places. Uh, when the mulatto man was dead, I went up and met Dr. Gardner. I asked him to come and see the mulatto. As we stopped to take up the men, the soldiers presented their arms again, as if to fire. Captain Preston pushed up their guns and said, stop firing, do not fire. I went to them so I could know their faces again. Thank you, Mr. Burdick. Please proceed with your closing, Mr. Quincy. May it please your honors and you, gentlemen of the jury. Having gone through the evidence on the part of the Crown, it is my province to support the charge against the prisoners. It is necessary to prove that the prisoners were that party of men who on the 5th of March last were in King Street, that they committed the facts mentioned in the indictments and the circumstances attending the commissions of those facts. All these witnesses have testified that the several prisoners were that evening in King Street. The next thing to be inquired into, gentlemen, is as to the facts. Mr. Langford came down about nine o'clock as a watchman. Langford and Gray were standing together talking. Langford was leaning on his stick and Gray standing with his hands folded without a stick in hand. Neither was saying or doing anything to the soldiers. As he often answered, no. Langford spoke to Kilroy, and after two guns were discharged, seeing him present his piece, said to him, God damn you, do not fire. Kilroy leveled his piece, and firing directly at Gray, killed him. The ball passed through his head, shattering it. 
He fell on Langford's left foot. Kilroy pushed with his bayonet and pierced Langford through his great coat and jacket. Here, gentlemen, is evidence of the true characteristic of a willful, malicious murderer. If we compare this testimony with Mr. Hemingway's, who swears to Kilroy's uttering that he would miss no opportunity of firing on the in, you certainly, gentlemen, can have no doubt in your minds but that he had had that intention at heart and took his opportunity to execute it. Mr. Bailey, the next witness, testifies that Montgomery, Carroll, and White were there. Montgomery discharged his piece first. Bailey thinks it was about half a minute before the second gun went off. The grenadier's gun was struck out of his hand by some person near him, and he recovered it and then fired. Montgomery killed Addicts, who was about 15 feet from him over the gutter. Bailey did not think to himself or the soldiers to be in danger from clubs, sticks, snowballs, or anything else. He saw the person that struck Montgomery at the corner of Royal Exchange Lane. He was asked if Addicts was the person. He answered no. From this witness, you ascertain, gentlemen, that Montgomery fired first and that he was on the right wing of the party. The next witness is Mr. Palms, who also saw Montgomery. The stick that struck Montgomery was thrown, he thought. Montgomery stepped back and then fired. He thinks he heard seven or eight guns. It was seven or eight seconds between the first and the second gun. As the last gun went off, Montgomery pushed at him with his bayonet and he struck. Montgomery attempted to push him a third time, and in that attempt, he slipped and fell. From the testimony of the witnesses, you have further proof that Montgomery was the first person who fired first, and that after firing, he continued to demonstrate signs of malice and malevolence by pushing with his bayonet and endeavoring to destroy not only Mr. Palms, but all around him. Mr. Quincy... Might there be such a thing in the law as voluntary manslaughter? This is a deliberate killing, not tantamount to murder. Chief Justice Lind, I readily grant there be voluntary manslaughter. To constitute murder, the homicide must be committed with coolness and deliberation. I agree. My application of this rule is that it comes within the evidence related with regard to Kilroy. I do not doubt that the act was done with a cool and calm mind. If you believe Langford, Kilroy was not molested. The person he killed and at whom he aimed, and the person whose clothes he pierced with his bayonet, were standing peaceably, one leaning on a stick, the other with his arms folded. I think, gentlemen, you can have no doubt but that all the prisoners at the bar were of that party of soldiers headed by Captain Preston, who went down to the Custom House on the 5th of March. That the five persons named in the indictments were killed by some of that party, but who killed those several persons may not be precisely ascertained, except in the case of Kilroy, against whom I think you have certain evidence. It is a rule of law, gentlemen. When the fact of killing is once proved, every circumstance alleviating, excusing, or justifying, or order to extenuate the crime must be proved by the prisoners. A person cannot justify killing if he can by any means make his escape. He should endeavor to take himself out of the way before he kills the person attacking him. I shall therefore rest the case. On the evidence as it now stands, the facts against the prisoners at the bar are fully proved. Until something turns up to remove from your minds the force of that evidence, you must pronounce them guilty.
Mr. Josiah Quincy, you may open for the defense. May it please your honors and you, gentlemen of the jury. The prisoners at the bar stand indicted for the murder of five of His Majesty's subjects. By their plea of not guilty, the prisoners throw the burden of proof as to the fact of killing upon the crown. But once the fact of killing is proved, the prisoners must prove matters they allege to justify, excuse, or extenuate the killing. Permit me, gentlemen, to remind you of the importance of this trial for the prisoners. It is for their lives. If we consider the number of persons now on trial and many other circumstances, it is by far the most important trial this country ever saw. The eyes of all are upon you. An opinion has been entertained that the life of a soldier is of much less value than others of the community. The law, gentlemen, knows no such distinction. The life of a soldier is as estimable as the life of any other citizen. The reputation of the country depends much on your conduct, gentlemen. Justice calls for candor in hearing and the impartiality in deciding this cause which has too much excited our passions. About five or six years ago, as each of you will recall, certain measures were adopted by the British Parliament which gave general alarm to this continent. It is not our business here to debate these political points. Indeed, many on this continent viewed their chains as already forged. They beheld the soldiers as fastening the shackles of their bondage. But disquisitions of this sort are for the statesmen and politicians. Your business here is to think, judge, and act as jurymen, not statesmen. Great pains have been taken by different men to involve the character, conduct, and reputation of the town of Boston in the present issue. The inhabitants of Boston have no more to do with this cause than you, or any other members of the community. You are by no means to blend together two things so essentially different as the guilt or innocence of this town and that of the prisoners. The inhabitants of Boston are not answerable for the unjustifiable conduct of a few individuals hastily assembled in the streets. To what purposes the soldiers were sent, whether it was a step warranted by sound policy or not, we shall not inquire. We are to consider the troops not as instruments for taking away our rights, but as fellow citizens who, being tried by a law extending to every individual, claim a part in its benefits, its privileges... It's mercy. We must steel ourselves against passions which contaminate the fountain of justice. We ought to recollect that our present decisions will be scanned, perhaps through all Europe. We must not forget that we ourselves will have a reflective hour when the conscious pang of having betrayed truth, justice, and integrity shall bite like a serpent and sting like an adder. Consider, gentlemen, the danger which you and all of us are in of being led away by our affections and attachments. But let it be borne deep upon your minds that the prisoners are to be condemned by the evidence here in court produced against them and by nothing else. Gentlemen of the jury, I shall now, for argument's sake only, take it for granted that the fact of killing had been proved upon all the prisoners. I shall point out to you those facts appearing by the evidence on the Crown side which will amount in law to a justification, an excuse, or at least an extenuation of their offence. Give the evidence for the King its full scope and force, and our offence is reduced, at least, to manslaughter. I ask you to listen carefully to each of the witnesses we shall present on behalf of the soldiers. Listen carefully to what actually happened on the 5th of March last in King Street. The defendants call David Mitchelson. I am David Mitchelson, a seal engraver. Give the court and jury an account of the transactions in Dock Square on the evening of 5th of March last. 
I went into Mr. Hunter's and found some gentlemen there. We went onto the balcony to see the transactions below. I saw a large number of people drawn together. I thought by the noise of them that we first engaged with the soldier. It was proposed by several of them to call out fire. Fire was called out several times, and then when the bells were ringing. This drew a great concourse of people thinking it was a fire. Most had sticks of various sorts. They made several attempts to get up a lane leading to Murray's barracks, but meeting with opposition there, they came down as if pursued. After making several such attempts, they assembled in little knots with various leaders. I heard them propose, let us go up and attack the main guard. Recollect the words as near as you can. I cannot recollect the precise words. Some people went up Royal Exchange Lane, some through Boylston's Alley, and some up Cornhill. Who led the party that went up Cornhill? I cannot tell. It was not light enough. I could not tell which was leader or which was follower. Did bells ring then? Yes. Did you not notice if the largest party went up Cornhill? Yes, they did. Anxious to know what might happen in King Street, I took my hat to go and see. When I was about halfway up the lane, the guns were fired and I saw flashes. How many people, do you imagine, were assembled in Dock Square when the greatest number was together? I imagine 200. Did you see a man with a red cloak and a white wig? Yes. He made a considerable figure there. Could you hear what he said to them? No, but after he harangued them for about three minutes, they huzzahed. On to the main guard. Thank you, Mr. Mitchelson. The defendants called Dr. Richard Hirons. I'm Richard Hirons, a surgeon. Do you know what happened at Murray's Barracks on the evening of the 5th of March last, before the firing in King Street? I live on Brattle Street, opposite the barracks. I was at home that evening. A little after 8, I heard a disturbance in the street. I went out to see what it was. I was told there was a dispute between the townspeople and the soldiers. I saw several soldiers pass and repass, some with bayonets, some with clubs. The noise seemed to come from the market. I saw people running across the bottom of the street. I went back in, shut my door, and stayed inside for about eight or ten minutes. I heard someone running through Boylson's Alley toward the barracks gate and crying out, Town born, turn out! Town born, turn out! This cry was repeated for seven or eight minutes when I heard the voices of a great many more people. Were they soldiers? I don't know. They might have been soldiers. They seemed to retreat and come on again and struck their sticks very hard against the corner of the house. Such a number, with the noise of the clubs, induced me to lock my door, put out my front light, and go upstairs into the chamber fronting the barracks. From there, I observed four or five officers of the 29th Regiment standing on their own steps. There might have been 20 or 30 townspeople surrounding the steps. After that, I saw a soldier come out of the barracks gate with his musket. He went directly to the middle of the street facing the alley, went down on one knee saying, No! Damn your bloods! I will make a lane through you all! Two officers grabbed him, took his musket, and shoved him toward the barracks. Where the soldier came out, was there a crowd in the street before the barracks? There were some. Most were in the alley. Some were near the meeting house. Did they say or do anything to the soldiers who came out with their muskets? The officers immediately took hold of them and turned them in. Were you called to attend to Samuel Maverick? Yes. Did he say anything to you? Yes. About two hours before his death, I asked him about the affair. He said he went up the lane. Just as he got to the corner, he heard a gun. He did not retreat, but went to the townhouse. As he was going along, he was shot. It seemed strange by the direction of the musket ball how he could be killed by the firing at the custom house. The ball wounded a portion of the liver, stomach, and intestines, and lodged between the lower ribs, where I cut it out. The ball must have struck some wall or something else before it struck him. Where did he say he was when he was wounded? 
He was between Royal Exchange Lane and the townhouse, going up toward the townhouse. I ask for Coroner Thomas Crafts to come forward and produce evidence. Dr. Hirons, is this musket ball Coroner Crafts just gave you the same ball you removed from young Samuel Maverick? Yes, it is. I recognize the flattening from the ricochet. Thank you, Dr. Hirons. The defendants call Henry Knox. I am Henry Knox, a bookseller. Give the court and jury an account of what you saw that evening. I was in the North End and heard bells ring. I thought it was a fire. I came up to see and heard it was not a fire. The soldiers and inhabitants were fighting. I came by Cornhill, and there were a number of people, 150 or 200. They said a number of soldiers had been out with bayonets and cutlasses and had attacked and cut the people all down Cornhill and then retreated to their barracks. The people withdrew gradually down to Dock Square. I came up Cornhill and went down King Street. I saw the sentry at the Custom House steps loading his piece. I came up to people who had said the sentry was going to fire. How many persons were there at that time round the sentry? About 15 or 20. He was waving his piece and held it in the position they call charged bayonets. I told him if he fired, he must die for it. He said, damn them, if they molest me, I will fire. The boys hallowed, fire and be damned. How old were these boys? 17 or 18 years old. I endeavored to keep one fellow off from the sentry. I struck him and pushed him away. Did you hear someone say... God damn him, we will knock him down for snapping. Yes, I did hear a young fellow, Usher, say this. I have no further questions. Mr. Samuel Quincy, you may cross-examine for the prosecution. Did you see anything thrown at the sentry? No, nothing at all. Did you see the reinforcing party of soldiers come down? They came down in a kind of trot, or a very fast walk. Did they come in a threatening posture? Very threatening. They pricked some of the people and said, Make way, damn you! Make way! Thank you, Mr. Knox. The defendants call Newton Prince. I'm Newton Prince, a Freeman. Give the court and jury an account of what you saw that evening. When the bells rang, I heard the cry of fire. I went out and met two or three men. I asked where the fire was. They said it was something better than a fire. I met some with clubs, some with buckets and bags, and some running with sticks in their hands. I went to the townhouse and saw the soldiers come out with their guns and bayonets fixed. I saw Captain Preston with them. There were a number of people by the west door of the townhouse. They said, let's go and attack the main guard. Some said, for God's sake, do not meddle with them. They said, by God, we will go. After a while, they huzzahed and went down King Street. A number of people came down to the costume house, and I went down. The soldiers were all placed round in a circle with their guns breast high. I stood on the right wing. When the captain came, the people crowded into him to speak to him. I went behind them. I went next to the custom house door. There were people all round the soldiers. How near were the people to the soldiers? About three or four feet from the point of their bayonets. The thickest party was by Captain Preston. When I got to the corner, I saw people with sticks striking on their guns at the right wing. I feared danger of their guns going off accidentally. I went to get to the upper end towards the townhouse. I'd not got to the center of the party before the guns went off. As they went off, I ran. How many did you see strike upon their guns? I cannot tell how many. Did you hear, at the time they were striking, the cry of fire, fire? They said, fire, fire, damn you, fire. Fire, you lobsters, fire. You dare not fire. Did you see anything thrown at the soldiers? Nothing but snowballs. 
flung by some youngsters. Thank you, Mr. Prince. The defendants call Andrew, Mr. Oliver Wendell's servant. I am Andrew, Mr. Oliver Wendell's servant. Give the court and jury an account of what you saw that evening. I saw a number of people around the sentry at the custom house. They were picking up chunks of sea coil and snowballs and throwing them at the sentry. Two or three boys ran out from among the people and cried, We have got his gun away, and now we will have him. Presently, I heard three cheers given by the people at the custom house. I saw a file of men and an officer with a laced hat leading them. I saw them pass through the crowd and plant themselves by the custom house. As soon as they got there, the people gave three cheers. I went to the people until I got to the head of Royal Exchange Lane, right against the soldiers. A grenadier said to a man by me, Damn you, stand back. How near was he to him? He was so near that the grenadier might have run him through if he had stepped one step forward. A person came to get through between the grenadier and me, and the soldier almost pricked him. He turned about and said, You damned lobster! Bloody back! Are you going to stab me? The soldier said, By God will I! Somebody held me by the soldier and told me to go home, or I should be hurt. There were a number of people towards the townhouse who said, Come away and let the guard alone. You have nothing at all to do with them. I saw the officer standing before the men. One or two persons were talking with him. Some were jumping on the back of those talking with the officer to get as near as they could. Did you hear what they said? No. I went to go as close to the officer as I could. Someone talking with the officer turned to the people and said, Damn him! He is going to fire! They gave a shout and cried out, Fire! And be damned! Who cares? Damn you! You dare not fire! And threw snowballs and other things which flew pretty thick. Did they hit any of them? Yes, I saw two or three of them hit. One struck a grenadier on the hat. The people right before them had sticks. As the soldiers were pushing with their guns back and forth, the people struck their guns. Another hit a grenadier on the fingers. The people up at the townhouse called again, Come away! Come away! A, a stout man who stood near me and right before the grenadiers as they pushed with their bayonets, the length of their arms kept striking on their guns with his stick. A number came down from Jackson's corner, huzzahing and crying, Damn them! They dare not fire! We are not afraid of them! One of these people, another stout man with a long cordwood stick, threw himself in and made a blow at the officer. I saw the officer try to fend off the stroke. Whether he struck him or not, I, I do not know. The stout man then turned and struck the grenadier's gun at the captain's right hand and immediately fell in with his club and knocked the grenadier's gun away and struck him over the head. The blow came either on the soldier's cheek or hat. This stout man held the bayonet with his left hand and twitched it and cried, Kill the dogs! Knock them over! This was the general cry. The people then crowded in, and the grenadier gave a twitch back and relieved his gun. He began to pay away on the people. I was then between the officer and this grenadier. I turned to go off. When I got away about the length of the gun, I turned to look towards the officer. I heard the word fire. At the word fire, I heard the report of gun. 
I saw the same grenadier swing his gun and immediately he discharged it. Do you know who this stout man was that fell in and struck the grenadier? I think it was the mulatto man who was shot. Do you know the grenadier who was thus assaulted and fired? I then thought it was Kilroy. I told Mr. Quincy so the morning after the affair. I think it was he from my best observation, but I can't positively swear it. Did the soldiers of that party, or any of them, step or move out of the rank in which they stood to push the people? No. And if they had, they might have killed me and many others with their bayonets. Did you see a number of people take up anything they could find in the street and throw it at the soldiers? Yes. Ten or fifteen around me did it. Did you pick up everything you could find and throw it at them? Yes. I did. Thank you, Andrew. The defendants called Jane Whitehouse. I am Jane Whitehouse, a soldier's wife. Thank you, madam. I begin by asking if you might... Excusing, sir, but might I be sworn on a Bible before we begin? Were you not sworn with the other witnesses? Indeed I was, sir, but simply raising your hand offers new true obligation to the oaths administered. I come here today to speak the truth of what I saw that night before this court and God himself. Mr. Winthrop, you may administer the oath upon a Bible. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you shall give before the court and the jury shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, Mrs. Whitehouse. May you begin by telling us your account of the events that transpired? I lived nigh the sentry and heard a noise. Went out, asked the sentry what's the matter. He didn't know. Some people came and said, there's the sentry, the bloody-backed rascal, let's go kill him. Were they throwing anything? They kept gathering, throwing snowballs, oyster shells, and chunks of wood at the sentry. Feed him from out of his walks to the steps. What happened next? A party came from the main guard, an officer which proved to be kept impressed in with them. He desired his men alt, and the sentry to recover his arm, fall in his rank, and march up to the main guard. The sentry fell in and the men wanted to move forward to the guardhouse, but could not for the riot. Were those in this riot shouting anything? Aye, the people called out, fire, damn you, why don't you fire? You can't kill us. I stepped to the party. I heard a gentleman ask the captain if he was going to order his men the fire. He said, no, sir. By no means, by no means. Then a man, the sentry, pushed me back. I stepped back to the corner and he bid me go away for I should be killed. A man came behind the soldiers, walked backwards and forwards, encouraging them to fire. But the captain stood on the left, away about three yards, and the other men touched the soldiers upon the back and said, Fire by God, I'll stand by you. He was dressed in dark-colored clothes. He did not look like an officer. The word fire came from a man not dressed as an officer? The soldier fired directly on the word and clapped on the shoulder. I am positive the man was not the captain. My attention was fixed on him. For the people said, there's the officer, damn him, let's kill him. Did you hear Captain Preston give any order to fire? I am sure he gave no orders. I saw the people throw at them. I saw one man take a chunk of wood from under his coat, throw at the soldier and knocked him. He fell on his face. His firelock fell out of his hand near the little run of water by the sentry box. He was a right-hand soldier. This was before any firing. The man recovered himself and took up his firelock. The wood was thrown several minutes before the man clapped the soldier on the back. The second gun went off about a minute after the first. I didn't hear anybody say fire between the first and second gun. Thank you, Mrs. Whitehouse. The defendants called Dr. John Jeffries. I am John Jeffries, a surgeon. Were you Patrick Carr's surgeon? I was. 
After dressing his wounds, my colleague, Dr. Lloyd, said to me, Jeffries, I believe this man will be able to tell us how the affair was. We had better ask him. I asked Carr how long he had been in King Street when they fired. He said he went from Mr. Fields when the bells rang. When he got to Walker's Corner, he saw many persons coming from Cornhill, who he was told had been quarreling with the soldiers down there. He went with them as far as the stocks. While he was standing there, he saw many things thrown at the sentry. I asked him if he knew what was thrown. He said he heard things strike against the guns and they sounded hard. He believed they were oyster shells and ice. He heard the people huzzah every time they heard anything strike that sounded hard. He then saw some soldiers going down towards the custom house. He saw the people pelt them as they went along. After they had got down there, he crossed over to Warden and Vernon's shop to see what they would do. As he was passing, he was shot. He was taken up and carried home to Mr. Fields by some of his friends. I asked him whether he thought the soldiers would fire. He told me he thought the soldiers would have fired long before. I then asked him whether he thought the soldiers were abused a great deal. He said he thought they were. I asked him whether he thought the soldiers would have been hurt if they had not fired. He said he thought they would, for he heard many voices cry, kill them. I asked him then whether he thought they fired in self-defense or on purpose to destroy the people. He said he thought they did fire to defend themselves. He did not blame the man, whoever he was, that shot him. Was he apprehensive of his danger? He told me he was a native of Ireland. He had frequently seen mobs and soldiers called upon to quell them. He had seen soldiers often fire upon people in Ireland. But he had never in his life seen soldiers bear half so much before they fired. How long did he live after he received his wound? Ten days. When had you the last conversation with him? About four o'clock in the afternoon, preceding the night he died. He said he forgave the man that shot him. He was satisfied the man had no malice, but had fired to defend himself. Thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Your honors, the defendants rest. Here, here. Mr. John Adams, you may proceed with your argument. May it please your honors and you, gentlemen of the jury, the prisoners stand before you for their lives. It is more beneficial that many guilty persons should escape unpunished than one innocent person should suffer. It is of more importance to the community that innocence should be protected than it is guilt should be punished. I shall begin with justifiable homicide. Gentlemen, the law has planted fences and barriers around every individual. If a person commits a bare assault on me, this will not justify killing. But if he assaults me in such a manner as to discover an intention to kill me, I have a right to put it out of his power to kill me. The question is, are you satisfied the people made the attack in order to kill the soldiers? If you are satisfied that the people made that assault with a design to kill or maim the soldiers, this will justify the soldiers killing in their own defense. If any reasonable man in the situation of one of these soldiers would have had reason to believe that the people came with an intention to kill him, they were justifiable, at least excusable, in firing. You must place yourselves in the situation of Kilroy. Consider yourselves as knowing that the prejudices of the world about you were against you, that the soldiers had no friends about them, the rest were in opposition to them, with all the bells ringing to call the town together to assist the people in King Street. The soldiers knew by then that there was no fire. The people were shouting, huzzaying, and making the mob whistle, which, when made by a multitude, is a most hideous shriek. 
almost as terrible as an Indian yell. They were crying, kill them, kill them, knock them over, and heaving snowballs, oyster shells, clubs, white birch sticks, three inches and a half in diameter. Consider yourselves in this situation, and then judge whether a reasonable man in the soldier's situation would not have concluded they were going to kill him. These soldiers were in such a situation that they could not help themselves. People were coming from Royal Exchange Lane and other parts of the town with clubs and cordwood sticks. The soldiers were planted by the wall of the custom house. They could not retreat. They were surrounded on all sides. There were people behind them as well as before them. There were great numbers of people in Royal Exchange Lane. The soldiers were so near to the custom house that they could not retreat unless they had gone into the brick wall of it. I shall show you presently that all the people concerned in this unlawful design were guilty of what any one of them did. If anybody threw a snowball, it was the act of the whole party. If any stuck with a club or threw a club and the club killed anybody, the whole party would have been guilty of murder in law. In this case, we will take Montgomery when he was attacked by the stout man with the stick who aimed it at his head, with a number of people round him crying out, Kill them! Kill them! Had he not a right to kill the man? If all the people were guilty of the assault made by the stout man, and all of them had discovered malice in their hearts, had not Montgomery a right to put it out of their power to wreak their malice upon him? If the sentry could not preserve his liberty without hazard to his own life, he would be warranted in depriving those of life who were endeavoring to deprive him of his. If the people did this, or if this was their intention, surely the soldiers had a right to go to the sentry's relief. The soldiers were therefore a lawful assembly. Suppose in this case... The mulatto man was the person who made the assault. Suppose he was involved in the unlawful assembly, and this party of soldiers endeavoring to defend themselves against him happened to kill another person who was innocent. I say, if on firing on the guilty, the soldiers accidentally killed an innocent person, it was not their fault. The soldiers were obliged to defend themselves against those who were pressing upon them. They are not answerable for it with their lives. If it was justifiable or excusable to kill Attics or any other person, it will be equally justifiable or excusable if in firing the soldiers killed another who was innocent. I shall now consider one question more. Provocation. An assault and battery committed upon a man in such a manner as not to endanger his life is such a provocation as the law allows to reduce the killing to the crime of manslaughter. Here is the boundary. When a man is assaulted and kills in consequence of that assault, it is but manslaughter. Every snowball oyster shell or cake of ice that was thrown at the party of soldiers was an assault upon them, whether it hit any of them or not. I am guilty of an assault if I present a gun at any person. Whether I shoot at him or not, it is an assault. If he shoots me, it is but manslaughter. Mr. Langford, the watchman, deserves particular consideration because it is intended by the counsel for the crown that his testimony shall distinguish Kilroy from the rest of the prisoners and exempt him from those pleas of justification, excuse or extenuation, because he had previous malice. 
They would conclude he aimed at a particular person. The sheriff's coachman, Hemingway, swears he knew Kilroy and that he heard him say he would never miss an opportunity of firing upon the inhabitants. This is to prove that Kilroy had preconceived malice in his heart. But, admitting that this testimony is literally true, if he was assaulted that night and his life in danger, he had a right of defending himself against any unjust aggressor. Langford heard the rattling against the guns, but saw nothing thrown. This rattling must have been very remarkable, as so many witnesses heard it who were not in a situation to see what caused it. These things which hit the guns made a noise. Those which hit the soldiers did not. But when so many things were thrown and so many hit their guns, to suppose that none struck their persons is incredible. Forty or fifty people round the soldiers, and more coming. The soldiers heard all the bells ringing and saw people coming from every point of the compass to the assistance of those who were insulting, assaulting, beating, and abusing them. What had they to expect but destruction if they had not thus early taken measures to defend themselves? The next witness was James Bailey. He saw Carroll, Montgomery, and White. He saw some round white, the sentry, heaving pieces of ice, large and hard enough to hurt any man. One question is whether the sentry was attacked or not. If you want evidence of an attack upon him, here is a witness. An inhabitant of the town, surely no friend of the soldiers, for he was engaged against them at the rope walks. He says he saw twenty or thirty round the sentry, pelting with cakes of ice as big as one's fist. Certainly cakes of ice this size may kill a man, if they happen to hit some part of his head. He retreated as far as he could. He attempted to get into the custom house, but he could not. Then he called to the guard. He had a good right to call for their assistance. Bailey swears Montgomery fired the first gun and that he stood at the right. This witness certainly is not prejudiced in favor of the soldiers. He swears he saw a man come up to Montgomery with a club and knock him down before he fired and that he not only fell himself, but his gun flew out of his hand and as soon as he rose, he took it up and fired. If he was knocked down at his post, had he not reason to think his life was in danger? The multitude was shouting and huzzaying and threatening life. The bells all ringing, the mob whistle, screaming and rending like an Indian yell. The people from all quarters throwing every species of rubbish they could pick up in the street, and some who were on the other side of the street throwing clubs at the whole party. Montgomery was smote with a club and knocked down. As soon as he could rise and take up his firelock, another club from afar struck his breast or shoulder. What could he do? It is impossible you should find him guilty of murder. You must suppose him divested of all human passions if you think him at the least provoked by such treatment as this. As for Crispus Attics, Bailey saw the mulatto seven or eight minutes before the firing at the head of twenty or thirty sailors in Cornhill and he had a large cordwood stick. So that this Attics, by this testimony of Bailey, compared with that of Andrew and some others, appears to have undertaken to be the hero of the night, and to lead this army with banners to form them in the first place in Dock Square and march them up to King Street with their clubs. 
If this was not an unlawful assembly, there never was one in the world. Attics, with his myrmidons, comes around Jackson's corner and down to the party by the sentry box. When the soldiers pushed the people off, this man, with his party, cried, Do not be afraid of them. They dare not fire. Kill them. Kill them. Knock them over. He tried to knock their brains out. It is plain the soldiers did not leave their station, but cried to the people, Stand off. Now to have this reinforcement coming down under the command of a stout mulatto fellow whose very looks was enough to terrify any person, what had not the soldiers then to fear? He had hardiness enough to fall in upon them and with one hand took hold of a bayonet and with the other knocked the man down. This was the behavior of Attics, to whose mad behavior in all probability the dreadful carnage of that night is chiefly to be ascribed. And it is in this manner this town has been often treated. A car from Ireland and an attics from Framingham happen to be here, sally out upon their thoughtless enterprises at the head of a motley rabble of saucy boys, negroes and mulattoes, Irish tags and outlandish jactars. Then there is no lack of persons to ascribe all their doings to the good people of the town. Facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Nor is the law less stable than the fact. If an assault was made to endanger their lives, the law is clear. They had a right to kill in their own defense. If it was not so severe as to endanger their lives, yet if they were assaulted at all, struck and abused by blows of any sort, by snowballs, oyster shells, cinders, clubs, or sticks of any kind, this was a provocation for which the law reduces the offense to manslaughter. The law will not bend to uncertain wishes, imaginations, and wanton tempers of men. On the other hand, the law is inexorable to the cries and lamentations of the prisoners. On the other, the law is deaf as an adder to the clamors of the populace. Mr. Payne, you may sum up for the crown. May it please the court and gentlemen of the jury, it now remains to close this cause on the part of the crown. I am aware, gentlemen, I have the severe side of the question. I am arguing against the lives of eight of our fellow subjects the very thought of which is enough to excite your compassion and to influence my conduct. It has been represented that the life of a soldier is thought to be less valuable among us than the life of a private subject. Nothing can be more ill-founded. The very appearance of this trial, the conduct of the witnesses and spectators, must satisfy anyone that a soldier's life is by no means undervalued, but that they have as fair opportunities of defense as any other subject. In the first place, gentlemen, the evidence produced by the prisoners is designed to prove that on the evening of the 5th of March, the town was in a general commotion, that vast numbers of people were seen coming from all parts of the town armed with clubs and sticks of various sizes and some with guns. 
that they assembled at and near King Street, that fire was cried and the bells rung in order to increase the collection. From this you may be induced to believe that there was a general design in a great number of inhabitants to attack the soldiers, that it was the inhabitants who began the disorders of the evening and that all the misfortune was the effect of their disorderly conduct. But, gentlemen, if we recollect the evidence, we shall find that previous to this collection, a number of soldiers had come out of their barracks armed with clubs, bayonets, cutlasses, and tongs. In the most disorderly and outrageous manner, they were ravaging the street, assaulting everyone they met, turning out of their way to assault and endanger the lives of peaceable inhabitants standing at their own doors who did not say anything to them. There can be no doubt but that the collection of people was occasioned by many different causes. It was a bright, moonlit evening, pleasant, with new fallen snow. Many persons were walking the streets. Great numbers were brought by the bells and cries of fire. A cry repeated by the soldiers as well as some of the inhabitants. They came out of their houses with buckets and bags as is usual in case of a fire. Great pains have been taken to satisfy you that this collection of people attacked, assaulted, and endangered the lives of the soldiers. Great numbers have testified concerning this affair. Many who stood in the best situation of observation saw nothing of such transactions as are testified by others. The showers of snowballs, oyster shells, and multitudes of sticks, the frequent and loud huzzahing and threatening cries which some relate were in some instances totally unobserved by a very great number of the best witnesses, many of whom were produced by the prisoners. Great reliance is placed on the dying speech of Carr as testified by Dr. Jeffreys. To me, gentlemen, it seems unaccountable that any stress should be laid on this evidence. Carr was for taking a sword when he went out, whether to fight for or against the soldiers is very uncertain. By his country and behavior, one would think the latter. He never joined with the people, nor went within six rods of them. He had been there but a very short time and was going from them when he was shot. I cannot conceive why his judgment of the matter, whose character and disposition we know not, without the obligation of an oath, and though a dying man should weigh more than the testimony of many judicious, reputable witnesses who were in the midst of it and told you they saw nothing that should occasion the soldiers to fire and wondered at the reason of it. It is proved to you, gentlemen, that all the prisoners at the bar were present in King Street at the firing. It appears by the testimony that seven guns were fired, and it appears pretty certain that Wems, the corporal, was the one who did not fire. It is certain that five men were killed by the firing, of which Montgomery killed Attucks and Kilroy killed Gray. But which of the other five prisoners killed the other three of the deceased appears very uncertain. But this operates nothing in their favor if it appears to you that they were an unlawful assembly. For it has been abundantly proved by counsel for the prisoners that every individual of an unlawful assembly is answerable for the doings of the rest. The king's troops have undoubtedly a right to march through the streets and as such are a lawful assembly. But if in such marching... They fire on the inhabitants without just cause. 
They surely are all answerable, though it cannot be proved who did the execution. On the firing of the first gun, the people dispersed and withdrew to a distance. The last gun was fired at a boy at a distance running down the street. The prisoners presented their firelocks again at the people who came to pick up the dead. It appears to me you must be satisfied. They were possessed of that wicked, depraved, malignant spirit which constitutes malice that, from the whole evidence taken together, no just cause appears for such outrageous conduct. Neither, gentlemen, does it seem, by taking the evidence altogether, it will alleviate their crime to manslaughter. Shall throwing a snowball from a distance, alleviate the crime of firing a musket ball amidst a number of people who at first stood so thick they could not throw? Here it appears that none of the persons killed were assailants. Attics, fifteen feet off, leaning on his stick. Gray, twelve feet off, with his hands on his bosom. And the other three just run into the street and scarce knew of the affair before they were shot down. If you believe Montgomery was knocked down in the manner asserted, his crime can amount no higher than manslaughter. But what evidence is there that any of the rest received such a provocation before firing as will alleviate their crime? The left wing of the party was uncovered by the people. The crowd was chiefly at the right. Andrew indeed supposes Kilroy was struck, but when we consider he looked about and saw Attic's fall, he must have confused this fact as, in my opinion, he has many others. The witness who testifies of Kilroy's killing Gray puts it beyond dispute that he shot him deliberately and after caution not to fire. The witness must have seen the blow if he had received any. Though the evidence is undoubtedly the fullest against Kilroy, yet it is full enough against the rest. When you consider the evidence against Kilroy and his previous threatening, you must find him guilty of Murder. Order. The justices will now charge the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, the prisoners at the bar are charged with having feloniously and of their malice aforethought shot and thereby killed and murdered Samuel Maverick Samuel Gray, James Caldwell, Patrick Carr, and Crispus Attucks, against the peace, crown, and dignity of our sovereign Lord the King. If, upon consideration of the evidence given in this case, it should appear to you that all the prisoners gave the mortal wound, or that any one of them did it, and that the rest were present aiding and abetting him to do it, the indictment will be well maintained against all prisoners, the stroke of one is, in consideration of law, the stroke of all. To this charge they have severally pleaded not guilty, and thereby thrown the burden of proof upon the crown. Homicide is of three kinds, justifiable, excusable, and felonious. The first has no share of guilt at all, the second very little, but the third is the highest crime against the law of nature. There are also degrees of guilt in felonious homicide, which divide the offense into manslaughter and murder. And the first of justifiable homicide, killing him who attempts to rob or murder me, to break open my dwelling house in the night, or to burn it, or by force to commit any other felony on me, my wife, child, servant, friend, or even a stranger, if it cannot otherwise be prevented, is justifiable. Homicide excusable in self-defense is where one engaged in a sudden affray, 
quit the combat before a mortal wound given, retreated as far as he safely can, and then urged by necessity, kills his adversary in the defense of his own life. Manslaughter is the unlawful killing of another without malice, as voluntarily upon a sudden heat, or involuntarily in doing an unlawful act. Manslaughter on a sudden provocation differs from excusable homicide in self-defense. Murder is the unlawful killing of a reasonable creature under the king's peace of malice aforethought by a person of sound mind and discretion. Malice is the grand criterion that distinguishes murder from all other homicide. Malice aforethought is not confined to an old grudge or settled anger against a particular person, but it extends to a disposition to do evil. It is the dictate of a wicked, depraved, and malignant spirit, as when one with a sedate, deliberate mind and formed design kills another. Justice Cushing, your charge to the jury. Thank you, Justice Trowbridge. Witnesses have testified that Montgomery killed Attucks. Langford swears Kilroy killed Gray. None of the witnesses say that any of the other prisoners in particular killed any of the other three victims. It seems that one of the six prisoners did not fire. It is highly probable from where the five victims fell and their wounds that they were killed by five guns only. If you find that, and also find that Attucks was killed by Montgomery, and that Gray was killed by Kilroy, it will follow that the other three victims were killed, not by the other six prisoners, but by three of the prisoners only. Therefore, the prisoners cannot all be found guilty. Since the evidence does not show which three prisoners killed the other three victims, nor that any of the six prisoners in particular killed any of the three victims, you cannot find any of the six prisoners guilty. A man is not obliged to wait until he is struck before he uses the necessary means of self-defense. If the blows with clubs were aimed at the soldiers in general, each soldier might reasonably think his own life in danger. Justice Oliver, your charge to the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, there have been attempts to prejudice the minds of good people of this province against the prisoners at the bar. I cannot help taking notice of one in particular, published in one of the weekly papers the day before this trial was to have come on. If you, gentlemen, have seen or read any of the libels which have been published and have imbibed prejudices of any sort, I do now charge you to divest your minds of everything that may tend to bias them. It is your duty to fix your eyes solely on the scales of justice, and as the law and evidence in either scale may preponderate, so you are to determine by your verdict. If you are in any reasonable doubt of their guilt, you must then, agreeable to the rule of law, declare them innocent. As I said at first, this cause is of the last importance to the prisoners. Their lives or deaths depend upon your verdict. And may you be conducted by the supreme wisdom to return such a verdict as that your hearts may not reproach you so long as you live, and as shall acquit you at the tribunal where the inmost recesses of the human mind shall be fully disclosed. The jurors will rise. Gentlemen of the jury, are you all agreed in your verdict? Yes. yes. Who shall speak for you? Our, Our foreman. Prisoners at the bar, stand and hold up your hands. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? Is William Wemps guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? 
Is James Hartigan guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty. Order. Order. Mr. Winthrop, please continue. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? Is William Macaulay guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? Is Hugh White guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you, is Matthew Kilroy guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? Is William Warren guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? Is John Carroll guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you, is Hugh Montgomery guilty of all or either of the felonies or murders whereof he stands indicted or not guilty? Not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. <laughs> Hearken to your verdicts as the court has recorded them. You upon your oaths do say that William Wems... James Hartigan, William Macaulay, Hugh White, William Warren, and John Carroll are not guilty, and so say you all. Yes. Hearken to your verdicts as the court has recorded them. You upon your oaths do say that Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy are not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter, and so say you all. Yes. yes. Gentlemen of the jury, thank you for your service. You are discharged. William Wems, James Hardigan, William Macaulay, Hugh White, William Warren, and John Carroll. You are discharged. Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy. You have been found guilty of manslaughter. Do either of you have any reason why sentence of death should not be imposed upon you? Your Honor, the defendants plead benefit of clergy. Your plea is accepted. You will receive benefit of clergy. The court orders that each of you be branded on the thumb and thereupon discharged. Sheriff Greenleaf, carry out the order of the court forthwith. The order of the court has been executed. The prisoners are discharged. Court is adjourned. All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having anything further to do before the Honourable, the Justices of His Majesty's Superior Court of Judicature and Court of Assize, now sitting at Boston with and for the County of Suffolk, Province of Massachusetts Bay, at present depart and give your attendance at this place tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, to which time and place the sitting of this court is now adjourned. God save His Majesty, King George the Third.
Thank you for listening to Rex vs. Wems, The Boston Massacre Trial. For more on Revolution 250, please visit revolution250.org. .org. .org. .org.